Hey, Retcon Raider here. Today we'll be delving into Design Document 7, which covers the last of the primitive tribes planned to appear in Fallout Van Buren. That means that today we'll be talking about the mysterious Cypher tribe. This is one of the shorter documents, just 31 pages long, but despite that it's actually pretty comprehensive. As with most of the other documents, it's very light on reference images, but otherwise it does a good job of giving us a broad overview of the location, including things like backstory, the characters, the quests, and even the planned epilogues. It's actually so densely packed with information that I'm going to have to split it into two videos. Today we'll focus on the area's history and layout, as well as the planned characters and potential threats, and next time we'll look at things that the player would have actually been able to do here. First, let's spend some time talking about the Cyphers. Like most of the tribes in Van Buren, the Cyphers have roots going back to the Great War. Back when the bombs fell in 2077, a group of military scientists and soldiers survived the carnage at the Atomic Research Facility in Los Alamos, New Mexico. The group salvaged everything they could from the facility, then began wandering north in search of other survivors, but everyone they encountered was hostile, either attempting to attack them or attempting to steal their possessions. Assuming that everyone else had either died or gone insane during the war, they eventually set up a defensible camp in the ancient Pueblo structures at Mesa Verde National Park. The group pooled their remaining supplies to make the camp as livable as possible, setting up a wind turbine and several water condensers, and building a small vault in the cliff face to house their one functional computer. Over time, their computer eventually began to fail, and fearing that they would lose irreplaceable knowledge of old world technology, they began taking steps to make sure it would be remembered by future generations. They began painting and carving the information on the walls of the Kiva, a deep stone pit near the center of the camp, and they stressed the importance of giving their children a proper education, with a heavy focus on math, so they'd be able to understand all of the complex formulas the scientists were leaving behind. Over the years, the specific reason for this precaution was slowly forgotten, but the tribe's slavish devotion to math and technological formulas took on an almost religious aspect. By the year 2253, when Van Buren would have taken place, the Cyphers were unique, a primitive tribe with an innate understanding of how to build and repair technological devices, but without the ability to actually understand how the scientific principles behind those devices worked. Although the Cyphers don't technically follow any particular primitive gods, they essentially worship numbers. For example, every Cypher is assigned a personal number at a young age, and this number helps guide them for the rest of their life. Although it doesn't necessarily mean that they'll always do things strictly based on their personal number, it does heavily influence all of their personal decisions. The Cyphers were originally known as the Painted People, due to their habit of painting their bodies with the same scientific formulas that they were taught to memorize as children. But their habit of working mathematical terms into their everyday speech led other people to refer to them as the Cyphers, under the mistaken belief that the tribe was deliberately speaking in code. The leader of the Cyphers is known as the Counter, who wears an old pocket calculator as a symbol of his office. He is assisted by the Memory Keeper, who is entrusted with preserving the knowledge of their ancestors, effectively acting as the tribe's shaman. The cliff dwellings have very limited space, so aside from the tribal leaders, there are generally only about 30 other people living in the village at any given time. This is generally restricted to families with young children and the elderly or infirm, with the more able-bodied members of the tribe adopting a semi-nomadic lifestyle, traveling around the Colorado area and only returning to Mesa Verde when they need to resupply. Unfortunately, when the player first arrived in Mesa Verde, they would find the village under siege by a group of raiders known as the Vipers. These bloodthirsty warriors were sent to destroy the Cyphers for defying Hecate's will, but the Cyphers are capable warriors, and they have the advantage of a well-fortified position. 
so the Vipers have instead settled for warding off travelers while they wait for the Cyphers to starve to death. The Mesa Verde location was divided into four distinct areas. The Canyon Approach, the Cliffside Village, the top of the Mesa where the tribe's hydroponic bays and water condensers are set up, and the caves that the tribe used to raise mole rats for meat. The player would enter the area at the west end of the canyon, and they would have to find a way past the Viper camp if they wanted to reach the Cliffside Village. This could be accomplished in a number of ways. Impulsive or foolhardy players could just fight their way through, but the camp would contain 20 able-bodied warriors, plus their leader, Drake, so it wouldn't be easy. More subtle players could instead sneak through the camp, or use disguises to bluff their way through. The player could also use the old mole rat caves to circumvent the camp, but these caves were infested with mutant two-headed cobras that the vipers had deliberately released to kill off the tribe's mole rats, so the player would have to find a way to deal with those instead. Amusingly, the simplest method of getting past the vipers was by playing a character with an exceptionally low intelligence score. In this case, the Vipers would actually assume the player was a harmless imbecile, and they would let them pass unharmed. There were only two other noteworthy encounters planned for the canyon area. First, the player could run into a small group of mutant geckos, which presented a straightforward combat or stealth challenge. The player could also encounter Alexandra and Blackjack at the end of the southern offshoot canyon. Blackjack was a super mutant who also happened to be one of the escapees from the Tibbets facility, and Alexandra was a bounty hunter who's trying to capture him so she could collect a bounty from the Legion slavers back in Denver. We'll talk about them a bit more in the next video. If the player managed to find their way past the Viper camp, and then talked their way past the Cypher's gate guard, they would be allowed to explore the Cypher's village. The village mostly consisted of homes for the villagers, as well as basic facilities such as a hospital, a workshop, and a storage cave. The two most prominent features were the kiva, the 20-foot deep pit where the original scientists transcribed all of their old world formulas, and a massive, non-functional laser cannon that the ciphers had constructed along one of the cliff edges overlooking the Viper camp. The final area planned for this location was the Mesa Top, where the Cyphers maintained all of the equipment they relied on to keep them fed. This is where the tribe had their wind turbine set up, which was in turn attached to a collection of 16 water condensers, which produced just enough water for the tribe's current needs. The tribe had also set up several makeshift greenhouses here, using hydroponic bays and plastic sheets. This allowed them to theoretically grow food, but by the time the player arrived it would be clear that something was wrong with their crops. The first time the player visited the Mesa Top, they would walk right into a fight between the tribe's farmers and a group of mutant plants known as weedlings. But again, we'll talk about that next time. Although there were about 30 people living in the village, only six of them were actually planned to be notable, named individuals. The tribe's current leader was a man named Azki, who was a bit more ambitious than many of his predecessors. He wished to find a way to restore the ancient computer left behind by the tribe's ancestors, so that the tribe could make full use of the old world technology it held. He was opposed by the tribe's current memory keeper, the Mnemonic, who held the more conservative view that such knowledge would do more harm than good. Another notable member of the tribe was Trig, the tribe's most talented inventor. She acted as both a vendor as well as a potential source of high-tech goods for players that lacked the crafting skills to make them. Assuming the player stayed in the tribe's good graces, they could bring technological components to Trig and she would assemble them for the player, presumably for a price. Trig's assistant was a man named Isaac, who wasn't actually a member of the tribe at all. Isaac was a former scribe from the Brotherhood of Steel, and he was staying with the Cyphers to hide from his former comrades. He could provide the player with information about the Brotherhood, as well as the civil war that was currently tearing it apart, and he was even involved in a few of the associated missions. But that's a subject for another video. Other notable members of the tribe included Hex, an ever-present guard, 
Radian, a member of the tribe suffering from a nervous disorder, Dinam, one of the tribe's farmers, and Sim, a member of the tribe who only appeared during Act 2. These NPCs were each involved in various quests around the village, but we'll talk a bit more about them in the next video. Aside from the NPCs, the document also outlined various threats and random encounters that the player could run into in the region surrounding Mesa Verde. The most basic of these random encounters involved packs of rad scorpions. If encountered at night, then the rad scorpions would be actively hunting prey, and they would pursue and attack the player aggressively. If encountered during the day, then there would be no obvious threat, because the rad scorpions had buried themselves in the sand to shield themselves from the desert sun. If the player wandered too close, then they would emerge and attack. The player could encounter rad scorpions an unlimited number of times, but there were several other special encounters planned for the region that could only be triggered a limited number of times. For example, the player could encounter wandering groups of cipher nomads or wandering viper patrols. Both groups would treat the player with caution, but they wouldn't otherwise be overtly hostile unless the player gave them a reason to be. They would presumably act as a potential source of information about Mesa Verde and the conflict between the two tribes. The player could also stumble onto conflicts between these two factions, which would give the player a chance to either pick a side, walk away, or wait until one side had won and then scavenge the corpses of whichever side had lost. It was also possible for the player to stumble upon the aftermath of one of these battles, in which case there would be plenty of corpses to loot, but the player would have to ward off the hungry wolves that were already feasting on them. One of the more curious special events involved stumbling onto a group of ciphers who were fighting against desert stalkers, giant mutated antlions that would quietly stalk groups of travelers and pick off the weakest of their number when their guard was down. So, now that we know more about the people and the places of Mesa Verde, what could the player actually do there? Well, like I said before, this document is actually pretty thorough. There were roughly 20 different quests planned for this location, and the player would also have various other minor tasks or activities they could pursue. It's actually quite a lot to cover, so we'll be saving that for the next video, where we'll talk about all of the quests, the hidden rewards, the easter eggs, and the potential endings planned for Mesa Verde. But for now, this is Retcon Raider, signing off. Thanks for listening. Oh, and remember, although I do love talking about Fallout Van Buren, you can check out all 700 pages of the leaked design documents for yourself by visiting the fan-run wikis. Links are in the description.